So the title of this talk is How Many Mugs Does It Take to Make a Living? And um, what I want to invite you to do is while I'm talking, be thinking about that and email me with your answer. And can you guys see me as well? Okay. Because what I'm going to do is I'll do like a lottery. You give, you email me your answer and it could be multiple choice as easy as that. You just pick one of those or all of the above, or maybe you have your own answer and I'd be delighted to hear that. So the question is that we're going to be thinking about tonight is how many mugs does it take to make a living and take a guess and be entered to win this plate. So I will ship it even to Canada, but I would if you win the lottery. <laughs> so um, is it A, too many? B, that depends. Whose living are we talking about? All of the above or other. Like if you have some other ideas that you want to share, that would be great. Um, email me your answer. There's my email address. It's also um, probably in the newsletter on my studio friends. You guys all have it. Just email me it by tomorrow morning and I'll pull it at noon and I'll let you guys know who the winner is and you will get this plate. And that has graffito on it. You see that there. <laughs> all right. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and how I got to this place um, so that you can understand the context that I'm providing this information or advice about. You know, in talking with you guys before this started, I realized that there's many members that you have, at least here tonight, that are really doing pottery more as a hobby, a creative outlet, that maybe making money is not even a big consideration. You know, we all like to sell our work, but maybe it's not a must have for you. Um, when Yvonne and I talked about this talk, it wasn't going to be on how I make my work. It was going to be on the business practices. So I have my business hat on tonight, and I'm going to be talking to you from that perspective rather than um, how I have fun at pottery, because I sure do that too. But for now, I'm going to talk about the business practices that I use. And then I know you'll have questions. So at the end, we'll do that. Okay. So you guys have met my sister. That's her on the left. And um, this picture was taken at when we sold the building that we had our marketing and design firm in, came in Bakersfield. Um, I started that business in 1981. And I kept it going until 2016. So there's a long stretch in there when I was also doing clay from 2000 to 2006, I was just learning. I was in my home studio in my shed in Bakersfield. And I was just like absorbing everything that they had at Bakersfield College that I could take. I was going to workshops. I was reading. I was watching videos. Um, talking to my friends, just doing everything I could that would that was just really for fun because I was also running a business and I had a son and a husband and a really busy life. So it was not a way to make money. It was a way to learn and the challenge of it. And then in 2007, we moved to Cambria and just by chance, really, I didn't have enough room for a studio at my house. And so I rented a little space and um, in doing that, whenever I was there, people would come in. And so we started talking and I started selling and I started learning about that. And so from 2007 to 2019, I had like brick and mortar storefronts. I had where people could come in. Um, you heard Kirsty talk about it today. That's how we met. That's how Yvonne and I met. Um, they could come in, they could see me working. We talked about clay because a lot of times, of course, it was potters who would want to stop and talk. And I learned so much. It's, it was a, a give and take, the whole experience. And then in 2019, thank God, right before COVID, I moved my studio home. It was just an amazing uh luck, grace that happened. So you could see between 2007, 
when I had a public studio and 2016, I was still doing my advertising and marketing work too. So I always like to tell people that because sometimes people would see me in the studio and they, the perception is like, she's making all this money and living at the coast because she's a potter. Well, no, I mean, I made money, but I had to subsidize it with my advertising and marketing clients. So I was still booking it to Bakersfield, coming back, working in my studio. I had a lot of energy, much more than I do today. So that's that nine years of doing both things. So I know a lot of you wear many hats. Some are doing things with art professionally and then do clay for fun. Um, so I was trying to do both. And I make a joke there, the years of marketing and making and very little sleep. It's a joke, but it was pretty much true too. Um, so we can talk more about that too. So here, just to give you kind of like how I learned the craft, I, I started out at Bakersfield College um, and I probably had about three or four years there and um, Phyllis Ward and... Alicia Samaru, who were also students there. We were like the old ladies. And that was way back in, you know, the 2000s, early 2000s. Um, at that time, the college system was really impacted and they needed our, our seats as students. So they said, you can't keep auditing this class. And, you know, it was another thing that was a, very lucky for me because Phyllis and Alicia and I started going to these other places here in Nevada College. Uh, we went, I know probably a lot of you know Lana Wilson and took a class at Aramont, um, Nick Jerling, um, Peter Biesecker and Susie Lindsay. Probably 10 years ago, I took a class with Linda Arbuckle at uh, Mendocino. And then recently you can tell from the COVID mass um, with Chandra Debuse. So. Chandra isn't, they're all amazing teachers, but I, Chandra is a truly, truly brilliant, amazing, patient, kind, um, fabulous teacher. Um, so that's that. And then some of you mentioned like the thing Ceramics Monthly and Pottery Making Illustrated. I've been fortunate to be featured in there. And then some other um, more art related publications like Professional Artist Magazine. And then on the right, there's just some shows and invitationals that I've been in. So this is me before the gray hair. <laughs> this is back in that little home studio in the backyard shed in Bakersfield. I finally had to get a little window air conditioner just to be in there. Um, and this little guy is my grandson. He's now 22. Um, but that's, that's when I was just doing it for fun you know? And then this was my first uh, brick and mortar studio. This is in Cambria. It was upstairs. If some of you know the, the little town here, upstairs above the Redwood Cafe, little tiny place. Um, and people would walk in. You'll notice there is a little table there that has some items on it. it, has a newsletter that I was doing, and it has a place to sign up for an email list. And I'm going to harp on that if you're interested in selling your work. Getting emails is critical. So that I learned how to do that there. I started really paying attention to um, kind of selling craft in a craft shop and ways to market that. This is the the schoolhouse people have mentioned. This was back I was I got to I was their first paid renter. Uh, between 2010 and 2017. And uh, it was just so much fun. Tiny place, but it was really fun. Um, I, I had play a, a, an area to show my work. I had my own work area. People could come and watch me, but it was kind of up on the what teachers used to teach from a little stage. It was up there and I was sort of partitioned off enough, but still able to converse. It was a lot of fun. And then this was my studio from 2017 to 2019, a huge building, big, big parking lot, a lot of Main Street signage, um, had the entrance on the right was the exhibit space, and then my work area, and then on the far left was a separate 
um, room that was all concrete. So it was my kiln room. It was great. It was amazing. Just like built for me. Um, this is what it looked like inside. Um, on the left is a little display area. And then the top right is a uh, workshop. I started doing workshops and I'm going to be sharing some about that. And then of course my workspace. This is where I am now. In 2019, I moved my studio home. And um, this was, you know, just a couple months before COVID came down on all of us. And uh, so I got help moving. I got the kilns vented. I got the electricity redone. All the stuff that if COVID had come before my move, it would have been really difficult um, because of the way things were back then. Anyway, I have two kilns here. I have a slab roller, an extruder. Um, I have we. I had a really. I have a really good friend that's one of those people that's real good with organization, and she helped set me up with all these storage bins. And um, I'm super well organized in this studio, even after a couple of years. It's great. This is some more views of it. Um, it has a separate kind of a. a Oh, washroom with a sink and glaze area, some storage back there. And then I did this too. I had a little converted uh, greenhouse in the backyard and it originally was my husband's. He was, he, he used to like to grow orchids and it just kind of, he lost interest. And so I said, can I take that over and had it set up with two wheels? Um, recently I hurt my foot and I just can't, handle it like this. So my studios changed again, where I brought my wheels down here. And I was telling Yvonne, I love it. I love having everything in one place. Cause I used to throw, then carry it back into the garage, let it stiffen up, carry it back to the wheel, trim, carry it back to the garage. It was crazy making. So that's no longer, I don't know, I'm going to grow tomatoes or something in there. And now this is the question, how many mugs does it take to make a living? So remember, you guys are gonna write down your answers and email them to me. And it could all, it could just be, you know, your answer could be, it depends, but see, I'm gonna get your emails. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about emails again. So here's the reality check. Um, before I move on, if some of you don't know what Scraffito is or the kind of Scraffito I do, this is a really pretty good representation. Um, I make much larger pieces too, but the mug is kind of, you know, the mug is our, as potters, it's sort of the standard of measurement that most of us use if we're functional potters. So here's what I did. I took the questions, you guys can use your own answers, obviously, but just to use it as a tool. And I kind of thought, all right, how much do you want or need to pay yourself? And in my case, I had, I was spending a lot of time doing pottery. So once I started doing it as a business, I wanted to make some money at it. So I gave myself $15,000. I want to clear $15,000 and put that in my pocket. You know, if nothing else, I'll be able to go to Enseca. Maybe I'll take a workshop at Aramont, but the, it has to pay for itself. I can't, um, it's, I can't, it can't be that expensive of a hobby for me to be renting a studio space and everything. Anyway, so what about the cost of making my work? That's going to be around another $2,500 a year. And you think of clay, underglazed glazes. Um, in my case, it eventually was $1,000 a month for studio rent. And then about $2,000 a month, um, $2,000 a year. I should, studio gallery rent was $1,000 a month. Studio electricity, garbage, water, internet, around $2,000 a year for that. And then if you do have a brick and mortar or if you're doing open studios, and especially if it's not tied into an organization that's carrying insurance, you need to get insurance. So that's another 500 bucks. So that brings it to $32,000 a year that I need to make in order to do it this way. I mean, now that I'm here in my home studio, this dynamic has changed because I don't have the rent, but I still have to help with some of the electricity and all that kind of stuff. And I had to help do the construction work to revise all of this. So I worked with the figure $32,000 a year, just 
to give us somewhere to start. And that wouldn't include any extra help. It doesn't include your startup equipment, your tools, your kilns, your wheels, um, any advertising that you might need to do, um, packing, wrapping supplies, which really add up when you're if you're selling online, that kind of thing. That would have to be additional. So you can see why I kept doing my advertising and marketing work. I mean, it really was subsidizing my startup of this business. So if I'm needing to make $32,000 a year in order to pay myself a little bit. And to, oh, we got somebody that needs to mute. Um, and we're using the mugs as the standard of measurement. I figure $50 per mug. I mean, some of you are selling for more than that. Some of you are selling for less than that, but just to give myself a, a base. So $50 per mug, I would need to make 640 mugs per year, 54 mugs per month every month. And then that means not only making them, but I have to sell them. I have to sell 14 mugs per week, every week in order to make this thing go. And that really was scary. Um, because here's when I start dividing up the time that it would take to do that. Maybe I take the first week of the month to throw, to trim, to make handles second and third week to decorate. And on a good day, my mugs, like the one that Yvonne showed you, take an hour and a half. And that's just the decorating part. Um, if I'm doing something new or it's really challenging or I make a mistake and I have to do it over, it's gonna be more than that. And then week four for bis, bis firing, glaze firing, final firing, and that's a lot of firing in one week, especially if around that I'm greeting customers. And, and, you know, as potters, everything is in its own time. So you're obviously, these are going to be overlapping. You're going to be, while you're bisking something, you're going to be starting a new cycle. But just to give an idea. So plus greeting customers, selling, cleaning the studio, which is a big deal, especially in a public place. And then packing, wrapping, and shipping if you do get orders. So that was my response to that. When you really start breaking it down, it's really quite, it can be really intimidating. And what it does is it makes the pottery more like a commodity. So it's all very transactional. It's like, make a pot, sell it, make a pot, sell it. How many can I do? And you get in this hamster wheel. And um, I would kind of have like kind of nightmares and daymares about that. So what eventually started happening is I began to look at my business more as I'm not selling pots. You guys aren't selling pots. You're selling, if you're, if you're selling, um, you're providing an experience. You're creating opportunities for connection. So what that means is like when these people are here visiting my studio, we're talking, they're, you know, sharing their own thoughts about pottery. Some of them like Yvonne, when she came in, you know, I learned that she was going to be teaching and that kind of thing. And so once that connection is made, um, the whole idea of someone taking home one of your pots changes. It changes all of it. So I'm going to be talking about that and how to you, how you can do that. I'm going to give you specific examples from my business life, but you'll have your own. You know, you'll be thinking about how you can use what you offer and turn it into an experience for the pe person that might be buying. So the first thing that happened was that people started asking me, "Would you teach?" and um I started thinking, yeah, I would. And I started doing it. Um, so that was a way to get that deep connection with other people. Because once they came and took a workshop, a lot of those people bought pottery. They took it home with them or they stayed connected with me for many years. The lady on the left, she was going to be here tonight. Part of the reason I put her picture in. <laughs> and if you're here, I love you. Um, the one on the left, is Ann Wolf. She's a, she was very active with the San Diego Potter's Guild and she took several workshops. She brought people to workshops. 
Um, we did the Potter's um, Ceramic Arts Network Ireland trip together. Um, anyway, we became good friends. The people on the right have also become friends. Robin, the one on the far right, has actually purchased, um, I'm going to be talking about wedding platters. And she brought so many ideas. To, I think I've done four or five for her. So it's once you make that connection with somebody, there's so many opportunities to carry it into other things. So in all these, I try to think about, you know, what do I make? Who is it for? And how I can reach them. And that way it gives you a little, like a plan, a little mini marketing plan for each. If you're going to teach, you're going to sell at shows, uh, you're going to do um, funeral burial urns. Maybe you're going to do it for people's pets. You know, how can you take that and turn it into a marketing plan? So what do I make? I make shared experiences with all these people that take my workshops. And who's it for? The first group was people seeking experience for fun. A lot of people that came to my workshops have never done anything with art. Some of them were scared to death and they just, you know, were drugged there by a mom or a sister or a, a, a wife. And um, so my job then became making this a really fun weekend for them to have connection with the person that they came with. And then the other group were potters, you know, people who wanted to learn specifically about Scrofito. And then how can I reach them? Studio visitors were, of course, you know, the primary one, but then my mailing list, referrals, and then the arts and tourism organizations started prom promoting the workshops. Um, in leading these workshops, if you're ever considering this, I really recommend that you standardize the registration and the payment. So you're not having to collect money when people are arriving. And I did that all through my, um, my website. So it made it really easy. And then really considering the people's needs. I have this picture on the top here because the lady that's closest to the wall, she's, um, Oh, Marty, I forget her last name right now, but she's from Bakersfield and she'd never done anything like this. And then the woman here that just is delighted, she came all the way from Texas with her friend. That's her, the two of them down below and is a potter that already knew a lot of Scrofito, but wanted to do some special things. And we worked together to have that done. So considering what they need rather than what I need, it really may turn it around. Um, more about the, how I did the workshops. Um, they would be stacked usually. I would do three in a row, like uh, I do a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And that way I have the studio already. I had, we provided lunch, breakfast, and snacks. How we doing, Ra everything okay? Are we good? Okay. Uh, breakfast, lunch, and snacks so that they didn't have to leave. <laughs> I, you, can, you can lose people in Cambria at a restaurant. Um, and then I would prepare all the clay in advance. They'd work with slabs. And uh, I would provide at each of their spaces they would have. You know, when you go to a workshop and you got to fumble around like some community college room for the right stuff or you know even at Idlewild it was a little confusing for a little bit for some of the students this way everything is right in front of them and um and then I would fire their work and clear glaze it and then ship it to them so it was a kind of an all-in-one fun weekend no stress um, and then it led to questions about, could you do commission pieces, like really individual commission pieces, and grew into kind of a sub-business doing these wedding platters. So um, people would come into the studio, they'd see samples of things, they'd ask me, you know, could you do this? And I'd say, when do you need it? That would be like the first thing. Um, and oftentimes I would learn all about the couple getting married, you know, they'd have a story. Sometimes they'd want part of their story on the platter and it, it was pretty fun. So again, I'm asking myself, what do I make? Who's it for? And really when I'm making these platters, my customer is not the couple getting married. It's the aunt who's buying it for, to give to their, her nephew and his bride to be. And she really wants them to know I am thinking about you guys. 
So that's my customer. I just need to make her happy. And then how can I reach them? Uh, mailing list referrals and Pinterest. And Pinterest has really, as far as this kind of thing, it's been a good, good way to go. These are some examples. The one on the left is kind of traditional. And the one on the right, I've done several for um, same-sex couples getting married, especially when the California rule changed. And this one just touched me. Otis and Joe, after 30 years together, and a group of their friends bought this for them. And it was a big surprise. And they had an unveiling party and it was very cool. And it has a quote there, a roomy quote. So I get to be part of that story. And that's such an honor. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that people are willing to pay for. So that was nice. Um, it led to other commissions. On the left is uh, pictures of mugs being made. And then the final set, a woman was uh, moving to Arizona and she wanted um, kind of to honor that move, I think. So these were made from her new home. They all have uh, plants and animals from Arizona. And then on the right is just an example of uh, insert that would go with the gift. I would gift wrap them and then I would put how it was made. So this is a picture of some mugs being made that were going to a couple moving to Hawaii and they wanted manta rays on there. So that way, you know, it's not just, they're just not getting a product. They're getting a glimpse of the experience of making the product. And um, anyway, I could talk a lot about that. <laughs> and then on the left, this is a cowboy poet had the, the poem and um, etch that in there with a illustration. And on the right is just my form that I used. Um, a lot of times this was used actually when I had the store because I wanted people would come in, they'd want to talk about a commission and it can get real loosey goosey. And it, folks that don't know about pottery have no idea how long it takes or how things can get, um, you know, there are variations that glaze might not come out bright blue, it might be a little bit more subtle, that kind of thing. So this form goes through that and I would lead them through that. And then they, uh, they would have to pay me 50% to start and then 50% at the end. And once this form was done and I had the money in hand, then it's my obligation. So, you know, I have to make sure that I meet all of that. Um, and I like to talk about this with people because sometimes at the beginning, especially, I would be working my ass off. And they don't know that. They're just wondering how come they don't have their platter, you know, in a week. And so I was always like hustling to get it done and not feeling like they, they're, they don't appreciate me. And then I realized, wait, no, that's on me. I need to tell them how I work in writing. And then they can agree to that and then we can move forward together. And it made a huge difference. So if you're doing this kind of work, I really recommend some kind of a form is really helpful or a letter of agreement, something in writing. And then um, this led to some other things. Um, I was made, I'm a member of Rotary and they asked me, I had, by the time I started saying no, I think I've done four of these. I've done them for different clubs in this in California. And um, in this case, these were mugs that had rotary on them, had the rotary wheel, which is the symbol. And they gave them to people who were helped them during their year. The president gave them to people. And, um, you know, if you buy that kind of award, like through a, uh, you know, award place, if it's more than just a ribbon, like it's a a little glass uh, etched thing, you know, that they're, what are they, how, what are they going to do with that? You know, instead they get a nice handmade mug anyway. So what do I make? I was making custom special awards for businesses and organizations and who's it for? It's not really for the end user. It's for the leader who wants to show I'm thinking about you I'm caring about you. I had somebody make this especially for you guys. And um, all of us belong to organizations. You want to look at ones that have the money to pay you because we're going to talk about that too. I mean, potters give away their work all the time. 
And we don't need to be doing that, especially right now. Handcrafted items have value to people. Um, so think about the organizations that you belong to where maybe, you know, someone is retiring from the school district or something and a group want to get together and have a really nice etched plate with some special quote or something, you know, that's a cool thing to give somebody. Anyway, this is, uh, I, I got to learn how to do these custom water slide decals and put them on the, that's the bottom of the mugs. And that shows the, the year and the, this was, I think for the district governor at the time. And I did have to get some people in to help me. So one of my friends was helping me. We, you'd, we'd pack them in a nice gift box. We'd wrap them. Everything's ready to go so that the, the guy that has purchased them for his uh, team, just, you know, it's a, it's a no risk thing for him. And then another way that um, I made connections was through these in-person events. And because I had a brick and mortar store that worked out really well, um, I was able to kind of go on the, the coattails of other things happening. Like we have a big art and wine festival here. Well, I got together a bunch of other craft people and we put together our own handmade show. So while people were here for the art and wine festival, they could come and see what we were doing. And we put up signs and we got PR and all that kind of stuff. So it was really fun. And um, what do I make? Events to market my pottery. Who's it for? visitors and tourists who want a special memory of their day. And I'd also say it was also for me. It was really fun to, you know, just like you guys all doing things together. Um, it was fun to bring others into my space. So we had uh, quilters, fiber artists, uh, woodworkers, and we were all demonstrating. It was pretty fun. So we um, got to get promotion through the sponsoring organization. We did our own PR. <clears throat> we all had email lists that we combined. And then we did flyers all over town. Um, finally, I use pottery now to make connections with the group that is my studio friends. So some of them are here tonight. Thank you, everybody who came. Um, and that's a reminder to you guys, wherever you are you're doing anything, whether it's, you know, at, a, at a, a guild event where you're inviting people, always get emails. Um, and I try to have a giveaway like I did tonight with the plate. I mean, it's it's really when you're asking people to give you their emails, they're giving you a gift. They're giving you an, they're accepting your invitation to, to bug them. Really, <laughs> You guys aren't bugged, are you? <laughs> I hope not. And then, um, you know, my obligation is to keep in touch. And it's about sharing our stories. Like we got to hear Beth tonight, you know, and I know some about her because I follow her on Instagram too. And it's just really, it's a real honor to have that kind of connection. And then here are places that you can think about um, where to get emails. And you guys might be doing that already, but it's so easy just to let it go. And yet it's so important. This just like, Again, asking myself the three questions and, you know, what do I make? Who's it for? And how can I reach them? All right. So this is what my studio friends situation looks like. And all of you could have studio friends, you know, it could be your neighbors, your family. That's how it starts. Um, and what what I offer my studio friends is special rates on shipping. Uh, if they're in the United States, I've actually been shipping for free. I don't know if I can always do that, but my last event on Friday, I decided to go ahead and do it. Um, free gift wrapping as well. And then special previews of coming events and then the studio friends newsletter. This is what my website looks like. I always try to have some kind of picture of myself um, because I think, you know, back when I was starting, I was kind of fretting because I was feeling like people were just buying my mugs and my other pieces because they knew me, you know, they were like friends or I, they had become friends at my studio. And I was telling my husband, God, you know, people are just buying my stuff because they know me because we're friends. And Mike just took me by the hand. He led me into our kitchen. He opened the cupboard and he said, Patty, what do you see? And it was all mugs from other makers 
people like I have Chandra's here tonight that I got. Isn't it great? <laughs> During her workshop. And I'm when I look at that, it's like, I, yeah, I could have gone online and went, oh, that's a cool mug that has a squirrel on it. But it, I wouldn't have just bought it. And now it's a cool mug because she made it. So that's how I buy things. And I think it's probably how you guys buy things. So don't be afraid to make that connection, I guess, is what I'm saying. That is the way it works. Um, so now I sell online uh, through my website. And then I do have two area galleries that represent my work. And I put that in red right there because I hear people saying you don't need to keep your prices all the same. And I wholeheartedly disagree with that. So if you're selling at a guild event and your mug is selling for $48, and you have an open studio event a month later, you shouldn't be selling that same mug for $24. You should be selling it for $48. And the reason for that is because if you want to be in a consignment shop or in a higher level, uh, like a bigger show, um, people, they find that stuff out and it doesn't feel good. You know, hopefully, whether it's a guild store or a guild event or um, or online, um, if everything is the same, it just for your customer it keeps it really clear, and that's important. And it's important for the people who are helping to market your work if you are in galleries or shops. Um, selling online, I use Shopify for my website. I haven't always used Shop Shopify, but I moved a couple of years ago and I really like it. And then I do my online event four to six times a year. If I go to the six times, I try to have a really different line of work um, because, you know, I only have so many people that receive that shop, you know, and um, I don't, they're not always going to six times a year going to buy a mug from me. So I have to have other things and that keeps it fresh for me too. I also use um, Square for like single orders, um, say like a commission piece. I can just write up an individual order and um, Shippo for creating labels and stuff for shipping. I was using Shippo for everything uh, and just recently started using Shopify. If I sell on Shopify, I create my labels and postage and everything through Shopify. Worked out really well. I just did an event on Friday and I was very pleased with all of it. Um, and how I keep that connection going, I email to studio friends. Those of you that are here are going to call me on this. I try to do one time a month. Um, during COVID, I got kind of bad about it. I don't, it was hard to keep the enthusiasm going. Um, but now I'm back at it again and I'm doing pretty good with it. And then I am on Instagram. I have, I think uh, it says 11.6 thousand followers. And for those of you that know Instagram, that totally does not mean that 11,000 people are seeing my work. Um, and we can talk more about Instagram if you're interested at the end. And then I do have a Facebook page, both a personal and a business one. Um, and then I do Pinterest as well. I always put this contact stuff at the bottom of my emails and um, people just can click on, on those links and send me an email or go to my website very quickly. Same thing with my Instagram. I have, you click on that smart bio and it gives you the different ways to reach me. So now... <laughs> I wanted to, this is where I kept adding things all day. I was thinking about other things I wanted to tell you guys about. So some resources for artists. Um, these are not potters that are on this sheet and they're not talking just to potters. In fact, most of the time in their minds, they're talking about painters and maybe sculptors, you know, more fine artists, but man, really, really great free advice. Um, Anne Rhee, she now has a whole business consulting thing for artists. But way back when I got this link and I had to go back and find it, you can click on that and just kind of in a, you know, very short amount of time, learn about the way she's thinking about art. And she's been featured on all kinds of big programs and stuff now. Um, and again, she does have her own consulting program. And once you're on her email, she will 
she's really good about hitting you with the idea. Finally, I had to email them back and say, actually, I just want to have Anne's contact information on this talk. And if I was starting out as a young potter again, I would definitely check that out. I think it would be well worth the money to um, have her guide you in creating a business. For people that really, I mean, if you seriously are quitting your day job, you're not retired, you need to make money and support a family. She has a really good way of, I think, thinking about it that's different than what we all usually are assume the way to go is. Okay, and then story brand. That's all this is free. You click on these things and you'll get business advice. Just listen to the podcast, read the blogs. Really great information. Allison Stanfield does, um, I've been on her podcast now. She does this art biz blog. It's free. She sends you the link and you can just read all about it. Recently, she had a, a whole um, section on, get. it was called something like getting it in writing and the kind of contracts that you need when you're selling your art, like a commission piece. Um, all kinds of, how to, how to plan for a major museum exhibit how to collaborate with other artists just and guest speakers all the time on her on her on her podcast if you don't listen to podcasts give it a try it's really fun speaking of podcasts the next one artsy shark i met carolyn edlin by listening to the lady above allison stanfield's podcast and carolyn was a wholesale potter and um, she had a career doing that before she became a business coach so she talked on Allison's podcast about wholesaling. And I thought at the time it was something that I wanted to do. I could just imagine my work, you know, at all these cute shops. And, you know, I, I had this fantasy. And so I paid her for her consulting and it was worth every penny. We had maybe three sessions. And after the first 40 minutes, I knew I didn't want to do wholesaling. I just backpedaled out of that so fast. The original idea was she was going to help me put together like a line card. And that's where you have your items and how much they cost. She was going to help me identify shops and all of that. Both of us just went, this is not for you. And it wasn't. And she saved me so much money and so much time. So um, now she has this artsy shark, lots of great information. Just go check it out. You don't have to pay her for anything for consulting, unless you decide that it might work for you. I am very grateful that I did because she was awesome. Then this is another free resource. This is Harriet Estelle Berman, and she has professional guidelines on her website. Um, this one is about open studios and it's a checklist of what things you need to consider if you're going to do open studio. She has a checklist for sponsoring organizations and a checklist for artists. Some of it is a little um, maybe dated, but you can you can check it out. And if nothing else, it will it will pique your interest or remind you, oh yeah, I've got whoa, refreshments. How do I do that? You know, so it's really good information and it's free. And she has all other kinds of professional guidelines on there too. And then for people who are doing shows, uh, Mia Ree, uh, you might have seen this. She's been featured on in both Ceramics Monthly and Pottery Making Illustrated, I believe, on her blog. The one it says um, from 2015, she actually has like her to-do list of how many pieces she needs to make, what pieces, timeline and everything. She does like the big American craft shows. And so she's planning like six months ahead. And then she updated it in 2022 because, you know, shows weren't happening the way they were and how would, she had made all of her money through shows, what she was going to do and how she did it. Um, so if you're a potter who's looking at doing shows, what a great resource. So go there and then you'll also see at the bottom of that second link, she has a learnpottery.com. And she's got a whole thing on pricing your work. Um, she has a really interesting method of doing it. And I think she reviewed it in Ceramic Monthly. She's also been on a couple of Potter's podcasts as well. And speaking of that, um, if you're not familiar with Tales of a Red Clay Rambler, um, check it out. It's free. It's just wonderful. Um, and that's Ben Carter. He posts 
I don't, I, he might not be one a week now, but they're great. And if you get on her, his Patreon, it's just $5 a month and you get all of them, the whole archive. And um, so I've been cruising through that lately. And then Ceramic Arts Network, they send out a daily email. And, you know, all these people are hoping you get hooked a little bit and will buy a workshop or, you know, you'll you'll subscribe like Ceramic Arts Network does clay flicks and all kinds of other things. But they also do a free daily email that's full of great information. So check that out. And then on the right is uh, Paul Blaise does the Potter's Cast. And he can get kind of goofy. It's fun, though, if you're just making in your studio. I picked these two out because they're really about honing in on the business part of things, um, especially Molly Hatch. She did with Ben Carter, it's been maybe four years ago now, a whole a six-part series called Making, Thinking Big, I think it was. And Molly is the one um, you may have heard of. She does, she takes plates and will do a whole series that's on a museum wall. It's definitely fine art. It's beautiful. And then she kind of took a shift the other way, anthropology asked her to do a piece of uh, many pieces for them. And she priced it out kind of like that thing that we did, only I'm sure much more thoroughly, like, what would it really take me to make this for what they could give it, what uh, they could buy it for? And then she said, I just don't think I can do it uh, without hiring a whole crew. And they said, well, how about if we take it and make a prototype? And if it works, we'll just buy your design. And so she really like, I guess she tells, talks about it. And she says that potters all over the world were mad at her because she said, okay, because she looked at this little teacup that they had made or, or mug. And she said, unless you were a potter, unless you were me, you couldn't tell that that was, wasn't made by me. And she thought, how can I compete with this? but I want people to use my work. I want to make a living. And so she did this other thing and still kept her fine art business, which is really an amazing feat to do both of those. So she's a person to watch and follow if, you, if you're not familiar with her. Ooh, okay. Apps I use. Um, Shopify, I use Square, like I said, just to send invoices for commissions. And then I use um, a software called, R it's not a software, it's a I don't know. It's it's a service called Artist Archive. And that tracks like when I take a, a group of pots to um, Park Street Gallery in Paso Robles, I give it to them with a list and photographs of everything that they have. And then when it sells, I take it out of my artist archive. And uh, that way I can keep track of it. And they know I'm keeping track of it. They really appreciate it. And I do, I only sell it to galleries now, but I've kept doing the artist archive and it's really helpful. Remember we were talking about pricing. Um, I was getting ready to send something out to someone that wanted a piece. And I couldn't remember how much did I charge because I had similar ones that were at Park Street. So I just looked it up and I knew, and that way it's, I'm not guessing. I've got it right there. It's really helpful. They do other things too, but that's what I use them for. And then I use Tailwind for my social media posting. I try to post on Instagram every day. And you know, now Reels is a big thing. So I'm learning about that. Um, but Tailwind will, I can automate that. Most of what I do is done in batches, whether back when I used to teach workshops, I would market as a batch. I would set up my studio as a batch. I would do three or four of them in a row as a batch. I do the same thing with my social media. So I'm sitting down at one time, usually, and I'm doing like five or six of them. If I was really good, I'd plan out a month, but I'm not that good. And that way it just posts it automatically for me. Same thing with Pinterest. And then color story is, I learned this from a lady that teaches Instagram stuff, not pottery stuff, but it's an app on your phone. And it's for, you take a picture with your iPhone and it's like kind of like um, Photoshop for dummies. It just does it on your iPhone. You can mess around with it. It's really intuitive. It's great. Not really, really great for high res stuff, but for the way I'm using it in social media, it's really, I use it probably every day. It's great. And then this gets back to the giveaway. So email, email me your answer 
And, um, you know, if you do something that you want to share or you have a question, that that's a great way to do it too. And um, I will draw a winner tomorrow and I'll contact you and I will ship this beautiful plate to you. See it? <laughs> okay, that's it for me. Um, Q&A? Who has a question? I guess we should open it back up. I'll stop my sharing. I have a question for you. How do you um, wrangle your emails? Like, I think some people use MailChimp. Um, I use Shopify. I was, oh, can you guys hear me? I was using um, Constant Contact. And then when I moved my store online to Shopify, they do that. I mean, that's part of the service that they do. So I just exported everybody from Constant Contact. Is I, I hope I'm answering the right question. And I moved them into Shopify. And now when people sign up for my email list, they do it right on Shopify and it's added in there. So I used to have a much lengthier way to go about that. And this just, whew, such a time saver. And I don't have to pay for constant contact. So that was nice. Mm -hmm. So we won't be going through your website. We'll be going directly to your email. So how will you capture our emails? Or oh, like if you have a sign up list kind of a thing. It. Got mm -hmm. it. So what I'll do is when you give me your email, I will go ahead and put it. If you're not already in, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and... Um, you know, I'm hoping that everybody who sends me their emails is giving me permission to put them in my studio friends group. And if you don't want to do that, just indicate that because I'm going to just naturally assume that you want to be a studio friend with me. And um, you pro if you're here and you were here through a link from me, you, you most likely are already on it. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, so you'll manually enter into Shopify? Yeah, if you're not already on a studio friend, unless you don't want me to. So if you don't want me to, just let me know. Okay. Yeah, because so I understand how that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I, had a, I had a question. So um, <laughs> a mess. Um, I very informative. I kind of had a very um, similar situation with myself, with my businesses and all those things. So it was wonderful hearing your, your story. Um, what I really loved was I just started very rarely sending out some stuff um, in the mail. I don't do a lot of direct response. And um, the few that I've sent out, I, I do sometimes put a gift in there. So yeah. instead of a gift, I was curious, the piece that you created, that thank you gift that you did. Is that something that you can share? Is that on your website? Because I'd love to take a look at that. Yeah. Um, so I try, that's a really good question because, you know, a lot of us are used to buying stuff online from other makers. And when it comes with some kind of a surprise gift in there, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So <clears throat> if somebody buys something from me, I always send it along with something I've already planned to put in. Like this time it was a ceramic bird like an ornament and I it, it's very easy to make you know cookie cutter kind of thing and it says hope pass it on and for every purchase I made a five dollar donation to the international rescue committee so that note was put in there and um, for me I know that you know that's kind of a costly thing to do that but most of you know I was going to say most of the people that bought in this, that buy my work online during these shopping events, um, they come back and buy again. And so capturing them and getting that connection and making it special is really important. So I do that. Uh, but this last time I had an event on Friday and I, I, I sold out like within 40 minutes, That's which great. is that another thing about batching it. Cause then by doing it that way, I don't have to always be checking my online store, restocking inventory, packing up one thing. Instead, I'm getting all my stuff out. Well, I'm photographing, I'm putting it on the site. I'm keeping all that hidden until I'm ready to go. I promote the heck out of it. I 
I open it at a certain time and then the fun starts and it sells. I've been very fortunate the last like maybe seven years <laughs> sells out right away. And then my, well, now he won't help me anymore, but my husband used to help me pack and chat ship and all that. He did take everything to the post office today though. So that was good. And it's already got the label and everything on it. If I had to stop and do like one of those a day would not be worth it, you know? So, uh, and then my little giveaway that I do, um, if I'm at an event or back when I had my online, my, my brick and mortar, I had these little ceramic leaves. I, I should have, they're still around here somewhere. They're just little leaves. They, you know, another it's cookie cutter kind of, but it's smaller and then black with this graffito leaf lines on it tied to a thing. Like, thank you for joining, joining studio friends. Um, uh, you know, I hope you stay in touch and that just that little leaf, people would give me their email addresses. So if you're at an event, have something like that, that you can give as a thank you. Um, you know, I appreciate all that information, but that's not what I was asking. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, okay. no, no. Don't be sorry. That was wonderful information. What okay. I was asking was, as you were talking, you showed a piece of paper that you inclo- included into, it was part of your presentation. Oh, okay. That's what I was asking about, because I thought that was brilliant. I love that. And Thank so you. instead of reinventing the wheel, I was just wondering if that was something that you share on your website, or is that just a personal thing you don't feel comfortable sharing? I would, I, you know, send me an email with the request. So I remember, and I will send you that. I'll say, I have several that I've done, you know, in the last couple of years and I'll send I'll it do to that. you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 My pleasure. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You gave oh. more information. <laughs> <That was great. laughs> I had a question. Um, how do you ship all your pots so they don't break? Ah, good question. So I used to do the thing where I would double box, you know, you do your box, you have two inches all the way around, it's packed in there. So I'd have like a mug in a box with two inches around it in another box with two inches around it. And then when I was at Chandra's uh, recent workshop at Idlewild, a bunch of us were talking about shipping and I was just kind of whining, I think. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. You're doing that. And I said, yeah, I mean, that's what I thought we're supposed to do. And no, 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 you don't need to do that. And um, so, excuse me. So on Friday, when I shipped everything out, instead of double boxing, I would take something and put it in the box has to be stiffer than just your regular priority one mail. If it's going to have something this big in it, right. If a little box. So instead, you know, I, I, everybody in the whole neighborhood gives me their boxes. Part of the reason I had to have an event because I have to clean my back room up. So my sister will come and visit me. (laughs) So it's full of boxes. It's my wrapping and shipping place anyway. So I, I just, I don't double box anymore. Um, I may be having to come back here next month and do a correction on this if anything comes back broken, but I'll stuff the piece if it's a vessel or a mug with paper, Um, then also the handle. And then I wrap it really, really, really good with paper. So it's buffered all the way around. And then I'll just put it in the box. Again, it has to have, what you don't wanna do is in the box, if, if you can hear it move, that's not good. So you just pack paper everywhere. It's in a stiff enough box that something can't easily puncture it and say a little prayer and send it out. And how are you, how are you, how are you, yeah, you're getting your, your shipping through Shopify. Oh, that the young way going on. I, yes. I, if I sell it on Shopify, I do it on Shopify and they have pretty good discounts from uh, us postal service. So I was, migrating all of my purchase, all of my sales into Shippo. And Mm -hmm. I thought that that was a better rate for me and that that was faster and easier. And it wasn't, this was really easy. Um, But if I don't sell it on Shopify, it's very awkward to make an order to create a label. So instead I'm still doing that. I'm, if it's one at a time, one thing at a time, like a custom order or a long awaited thing that finally gets shipped to somebody, 
then I will um, uh, write it up on Square, send it via email, get the money, and put it uh, do it do it through Shippo. And Shippo, just the online website. Yeah, it's a provider of so you you um, once you're registered with them, you can prepare the box. Pre- weigh the box. You just have to have a little scale and, you know, your measuring tape, you give them all the dimensions, the measurement, and then you print out a label and it will automatically charge you because you'll have an account with them charge you for the cost of the postage. Okay, cool. And then I I just, I'm sorry. My only take was I, I figured out that I'm using egg crates. I bought really cheap. Seems like that's the best. I found. I have a really good tip. I have a friend that started, she gets medication four times a month in these styrofoam containers. The styrofoam containers are like little ice chests, right? And they come, when she gets them, they're in a cardboard box and they just slide right in. So I ditched the cardboard. She started giving them to me. And at first I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do with these? I can't ship with these. But you know what? You can. So in this last um, shopping event, we have somebody that needs yeah. to mute. Um, in this last shopping <laughs> event, I I had shipments that went to Florida, New York, and Texas, Montana, and usually that would be more money than I'd want to spend. With these boxes, it was great. So I just put a mug, wrapped them up, put a mug, and then taped them all around. And they're light as a feather. And so anybody that gets uh, like a prescription in the mail that needs to stay cool might have those. And they just, they don't want to have to throw them away. So um, they like having somebody to recycle them too. And the other thing I do when I send out my boxes, I put a little uh, sheet in there that says, um, you know, please excuse my uh, recycled packaging. Um, I try to use all recycled peanuts and, you know, the rest of it um, when I ship. And I hope you'll pass this on to another shipper if possible. And that way they're not opening the box going, God, she's using an old Amazon box, you know, instead they're going, oh, they're part of the environmentally conscious consumer by by buying from me. (laughs) So then after you go on Shopify and you get all the, you get it all weighed and paid for and everything. Where do you take it? Okay. I was during COVID. I was, cause I didn't want to go to the post office and I was putting a table out in my driveway and putting USPS. Yes. You know, and this is where they are. And I live in a really small town. Um, and that worked really well until it didn't. I had you know, 14 or 15 boxes, some of them with multiple orders going out. And a couple of days later, I'm like getting questions from people like where I thought my package was coming. And then I'd get another, I'd contact somebody and go, did you receive your package? Yes, I did. You know, and the tracking was on. I try to find the tracking for the other ones, not there. And what I found out was that when the postman comes with his little cart, He takes a scanner thing and scans them. And if they're, they don't go into the car, into the, his vehicle without being scanned. Anyway, after much research and me at first, I thought the post office had messed up and lost because some of them came, went through and some of them didn't. Well, somebody came by and loaded up the car with my boxes of pottery and got, you know, like nine or 10 boxes before they someone else drove by or we came outside or whatever. Anyway, long story short, now we take them with a manifest. So let's say you have 15 boxes, you print out a manifest and then the post office doesn't have to scan each thing. They just go, these are the 15 boxes on the manifest. You say yes. And they just scan that one manifest. It groups everything together. And that's more detail than you probably need, but it's really, if you're selling online and um, need something like that. It, it's worked out pretty well for me. Does that make sense? 
um, I take my stuff to the UPS store because they'll take both UPS and um, uh, 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 postal stuff. And they're right. a lot closer than the post office. And um, depending on where it's going, how much it weighs, what size and all that stuff, uh, I can use UPS through um, pirate ship and it's super cheap. Nice. So that, I don't know what pirate ship is, but it sounds like it's a discount. I, I think it's, I think it's like Shippo. Yeah. Shippo will give you UPS rates, right? Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've found UPS for big things is cheaper, but for smaller things, um, it's half to use the post. That's where, where I am here. You know, if I, right. if, it's, if it goes into two pounds or under, yeah. Yeah. The postal, yeah. yeah. Yep. But but when I discovered the UPS store took both um, both kinds, that was such a time saver to me. It's That's just... nice. I I'm gonna have to look into that because we do have we have like a business center store here. I didn't realize they. Well, would... um, also office um, Office Depot will take your packages as well. No, we don't have one of those here. <laughs> Are you? I'm yes. a little I'm a little bit confused. If you're using Shopify. Uh -huh. Do they use um, the post office? Is that where you, I mean, why not just go have just print it out through the post office? Because you you can, if you use Shopify, let's say you're selling something online, uh -huh. then all the information, if you, if you were to go onto my store and buy something, you'd be putting all your delivery, you know, something that needed to be shipped, all your shipping information on there. So I don't mm -hmm. have to re-enter it anywhere. It just goes right oh. in. And they've negotiated discounts with uh, the UPS, with the USPS, with, and some common oh, okay. carriers as well. Yeah, Etsy works the same way. All the information is right there, and they have a discounted rate for that stuff. Whereas if you go just on the post office site, there are no discounts. Right. Do you, do you sell a lot of your work through Instagram? I mean, do people buy from Instagram? No, I don't buy, they might, if, if they're interested in a piece or they see something they like and they ask me about it, um, occasionally I'll do like we, we start DMing and I'll ask them to go over or I'll ask them for their emails if it gets serious. But I don't really like to spend a lot of time doing that. Instead, I will ask them to go to my um, website and check out the things there. And the reason for that is I want those emails. Um, for those of you that have been on Instagram a bunch, you've probably seen the algorithm change. And for, for potters or any anybody that's selling anything on Instagram, it's really easy to sell things. But what if they sell, if they change the algorithm, it could wipe out your business. I mean, because your business practice and the way people are used to seeing your work can change overnight. So instead, you get their emails and you, your relation, the relationship with the buyer is with you. It's not through Instagram. I mean, Instagram is free and it's awesome and all of that, but you don't own it and you don't own the way that it works. So, um, yeah. Really Same thing with Pinterest. Uh, a lot of my my um, studio friends, subscribers come from Pinterest. And I don't even, it's probably even not a lot of the subscribers, actually just a lot of the people that go to my site. So I think, I mean, I know how I use Pinterest. I like look at other artists work, right? So I'm not in my case, I'm usually not shopping. I'm looking and I'm inspired. And so I might click on something and go to somebody's website. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be buying. So I don't sell directly through Pinterest or Facebook or Instagram. Instead, I use them for lead generators and to stay in touch with people. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you use Pinterest? as far as, um, you know, frequency of posting and sure. what kind of things you post uh, or, you know, sharing. Yeah. I, yeah. I was always curious about how people use it. Yeah. So how I use it. Um, I, when I started, I was individually, like you could take pictures that are on your website and you can just share them to your Pinterest feed. You can take, uh, 
things from Instagram, other people's websites, you know, and do that. And so for when I started, I was trying to create um, boards that people who might be interested in my pottery would be interested in. Um, you know, I talked about the wedding, you know, I was trying to attract wedding consultants and people like that. I really tried to think strategically about who my customer is. What ended up happening eventually, years later, um, I have an application called Tailwind that I use a lot. And what that lets me do, once I, on Tailwind, I create a post and on it, I, it, I use it for Instagram too, but I'm going to talk just about Pinterest right now. I'll create a post and let's say I do a mug event. I, every, every late November, I do mug mania where it's all mugs and I'll have like 60 different mugs, all hand etched, take a picture of them. I'll put them. Pinterest has a, ha, or Tailwind has a program called Loops, L O O P S. And what it lets you do, you make a post and you make a frequency, and maybe you label the uh, loop mugs, and it will automatically through the days and the weeks, it will post that to Pinterest. You don't have to do anything other than set up that initial loop. And occasionally, maybe like mm, once a month, I'll do new ones. But for the most part, after three years of creating loops, it just keeps doing it. So then I go over to my website and I look up my analytics and I'm seeing 80% of my new visitors are coming from Pinterest. So that's make me think, okay, why? And what do I need to do about that? So one of the things I hope you guys saw through this presentation through the years, I mean, everything, whether it's changing how I'm doing my mailing and which Shippo or Shopify I'm using to this kind of now rethinking, like just recently, I'm seeing this with Pinterest. I need to start paying more attention to that because I don't really understand it. I don't understand why they're coming to my website. My assumption is that most of them are artists and you know, that's another thing. My husband always has these wise things because I said, God, you know, I think the people who are really interested in my work, like on Pinterest and Instagram and stuff, they're just other potters. And again, he said, look at your cupboard. You're a potter. How much, how many mugs do we have in there? And we probably have like 40 different handmade mugs from other makers. So, you know, potters buy pots. So anyway, so I, I, you know, I don't think that answered your question completely, but I'm not really sure. I just know something's happening. So I'm going to start paying more attention to that. But look, if you're interested in Pinterest and you don't want to have to spend hours posting, you know, do some of it so you understand about it, but then think about the loop. It's um, been a hu huge time saver for me. Any more questions? I do have a question that's not related to actual business. Okay. If that's okay. Sure. Um, this has to do with, I, I do scraffito and I don't like real shiny. I'm just not uh -huh. a shiny person. Uh -huh. So I've been experimenting with different things and I can't seem to find anything that I like that can kind of prevent fingerprints. I, this is not necessarily for um, utilitarian wear. Okay. So this is more like sculptural. And so I actually just bought this liquid quartz, which is from Australia. Mm -hmm. And I do not like what it's doing to the black underglaze. I think it's fine. I think I'm going to try it on my porcelain pieces that don't have underglaze. But for the scruffito pieces, I tried painting it on and I tried spraying it. And, and I don't like what it's doing for the black. I have a thought. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm going to go through several of them. One is, is if you do have a clear that is, you like the part of it, I brush my clear on really thin and it, mine has to be food safe. So but the outside, like of a mug or the rim of a plate, I'll put it on really thin because I don't want it to cloud up. Same thing with matte. I use a, a matte clear on some of my work because I don't want that high gloss but you mentioned sculptural and you know you can cold finish that so you don't have when you when you say cold finish it what do you mean I mean 
you get a shoe polish that you like. I mean, you, you fire your piece to notification yeah. if you need, if it needs to mm -hmm. be sturdy and uh, if it needs to go outside, that's a whole nother thing, but let's say it's an inside sculptural piece mm -hmm. and then you can put, you can use like a, a shoe polish or a matte varnish or, you know, all kinds of stuff and you put it on and cause it doesn't need to be fired again, really. No, no, I'm, I'm yeah. basically what I'm looking at is I don't want to have any kind of oils from your hands. You know, when you pick up the piece, you move the piece. If you have any kind of oils oh, on your hands, you get like a fingerprint. So I don't, <laughs> what I want to do is, is put something on there. I wouldn't mind it if it made it even a little bit darker, but I don't want it shining. I would try practice with some cold finishes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I'd go to, I'd actually do a, a Google search and see what some other artists are doing. Cause once that came into, like, I did some sculptural work for a while and um, God, it opens up all kinds of stuff. There's well, and if, go on, go to YouTube and cold finish pottery and you'll get to see demonstrations and products of what people are using and what the final result is. Thank you. Yeah. And I do own one of your pieces. Oh, thank you. Many years ago, I bought a piece of yours. It's a, uh, was a little pillow. Oh, and it yeah. was with a crow on okay. it. And it's yeah, hanging in my you. kitchen. <laughs> you. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. I love it. <laughs> I have a question, Patty. Okay. It's a Scrofito question since we're going to be working on that. All right. And when I hold your, when I hold your piece that I own, I'm just wondering if you could show me or us, what tool do you use to carve your scraffito? Because sure. I can't even feel the difference in the surface. Like it feels like one surface, but I know you've scratched where it's white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know where it's black, there is underglaze but it yep. feels even. Yeah. And some of that has to, scraffito is very dependent on when you go to it, you know, like a lot of processes in clay, it's really dependent. So if you go to, if you have a, have a um, leather hard piece, if it's not, if it's still a little bit tacky, you don't want to mess with it yet. So you want it to be medium leather hard and you brush on your scraffito or your, I'm sorry, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you, brush on your <laughs> you brush on your underglaze. And then um, I will usually take uh, one of these. Uh, this is a diamond core tool, ball stylus type. So it has a little, little tiny teeny, here's a, I have, you know, and these work fine too. These are just like Kemper tools and they have a little ball stylus on the end. And I use that to draw out what I'm gonna do. Um, and then I start etching away. And these are good for making fine lines. And then something like this, oh, wait, I'm trying to get, it's hard. I saw BD Clark one time, he was giving a, a how to do pottery on this and he kept doing like this. And now I understand why it's really hard <laughs> to figure out. So, this is like a little, um, uh -huh. I don't know, a little shovel. Mm -hmm. So I use this to scrape away part. The main thing is not going to it too wet. Cause if you do, you're going to create deeper grooves. And that's when you start feeling, um, I can show you guys, I'm going to just, I'm going to try this. We'll see uh, a work that is big enough. You might be able to see, can you guys see that? No, it's probably not light enough, huh? We can see it. So a little bit. That that the way I made those lines without it being too deep is real on a big piece. You have to guard the part of the the piece that's not going to be scraffitoed yet. Cause I've learned that a big piece like that, I'm working on one part way over here. And in order to for it to be okay, the way I I like it when you're you you do your scraffito and it comes up as a ribbon. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not murky and you do not want to create dust. So you don't want it to get too dusty, too stiff. Mm -hmm. 
So I have a whole bunch of these around my studio. And uh, it's just a spray bottle. Okay. This, I learned at Idlewild, this was the best. This is like nine bucks online. And it's just a really easy sprayer. Instead Ooh. of making a direct, it does a, a nice mist. Mm -hmm. So on this piece, I could keep spraying it. And then if I needed to, plastic is all over the studio. Um, I can cover up the part I'm not working on, work on the rest, you know, and just kind of work my way around it. If at any point it starts getting too dry and creating dust, you want to stop, clean it off, mist it, and then you can go back to work. You do not want that dust coming up at all. That's really important, especially for those of us that are working in this all the time or we're teaching it. I can't tell you how many times in my studio when I had the brick and mortar, I'd have people come in that teach pottery and they were telling me how they sweep their studios. And I'm like, no, don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's graffito is a, is a hat can be a hazard in that way. So you want to keep your studio clean and you want to always come to it when it's, you know, anyway. So the other yeah. thing about that is after you do your, your cuts or your etching, you don't want to, uh, it's going to leave little tags, you know, little bits. You don't want to immediately try to get those out. I wait until they're dry and then get them out. And that'll help create the smoother surface too. I hope that's a that brush to get them out or what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. So I wait till it's pretty dry and then I'll use like one of these makeup mm -hmm. brushes work really well because they're so soft. Yeah. What is the name of that mister that you learned about? in this this is just like on Amazon. I, I just picked it out because it looked like the one that we use there. So, you know. Yeah, that's great. Nice long. <laughs> I'm getting my computer. Yeah. It's for hairstyling. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. So Mr. for I hair. It's, okay. I think cool. it's called I think it's called Flonase or something like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, actually, I find the little mistress for the eyeglass cleaners. Ah. It, that the little tiny ones, those. Do a really nice thin spray. Yeah. I, I wanted to know: Do you ever put wax on your pieces and then carve a liquid of wax? Uh, you know, I started doing that. I went. Chandra does that, and you know, I just went to her class. Um, and I, you know, I don't like the way the mac the the wax smells when it's burning. You know, even though mm -hmm. I have all the vents and everything, it still bugs me. And I know that it's not, you know, toxic supposedly, but I did do that there. And I like the idea of it. I made, do you guys have time for this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <I> was, okay. <laughs> yes. People will leave if they want to Patty. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get the ones that I made like that. So I made this one like that. I wanted to combine, you know, what I do, this graffito. I don't think you guys can see that very good. It has humpback mm -hmm. whales on it. And um, so you, in that case, you wax the whole thing and you're drawing through it. I don't know. You know, you go to a workshop and get really excited about, oh, I'm going to do this and that. And I tried and I brought things home and I fired. I had to leave early because my husband was sick back here in Cambria with COVID and he we got yeah. really sick. But even three days of her workshop was amazing. <clears throat> so I missed half of it and they let me bring my work home and finish it. Um, and, you know, I did, I brought it home and, you know, it's okay, but it's not her and it's not me. So I don't really know how I'm going to merge the two. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm experimenting with the liquid wax, but I'm not sure if I like it or I don't like it. It, it leaves, seems to leave a little bit of a residue. Mm. So I find that you have to kind of scrub it off. Mm. So I, I, I'm also, do you ever do anything that's totally flat? Because I just did two, two parts of a piece. I just unloaded the kiln today and one of them cracked. And the other one didn't. And I put uh, aluminum hydrate underneath it. It is, it was porcelain, but it. I don't know. I you know, I, if you, if you, the, I forget the woman's name who spoke to you guys the month before last, I guess, uh, on tile making. 
she seemed amazing. And if I was going to do a lot of flat pieces, I would be watching her video again and, and maybe even contacting her because I, I don't do that kind of work, but she, she, she was amazing. And she was one of your presenters. So yeah, check out I'll her. Check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else have a question? Do you ever get frustrated with doing ceramics? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, but you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, you know, if it were easy, everybody would do it, right? Yeah. And it's kind of, it was really funny. My sister, she's there. You can see her in her quilt room. She's she makes these huge quilts. And I was there visiting her one day and she was having to tear something out. And I was like, God, how can you stand to do that? That would drive me crazy. And she just looked at me and she said, are you kidding me? You will spend hours on a piece and then put it into the kiln and the thing will come out cracked. <laughs> she goes, at least I can just, you know, and it's so funny for me, that's just part of it. You know, yeah, today, today was just one of those days. Yeah. I, I, it was like, wow, I had four pieces out of four that just came out horrible. It's like, I, I feel like shooting myself in the head. Yeah. That's how I feel about these. I spent so much. This is like, you know, from Shonda's workshop. <laughs> it does not look like what I thought it was going to look like. And it shouldn't, right? Because I'm new at that. I'm not Chandra right. Debuse. I'm, I, I mean, and I'm never going to be her. And the thing um, I used to tell at my workshops, there is that if you, if you Googled the gap and it talks about um, it's uh, the guy who does this American life um, on NPR. And he's mm -hmm. talking about, um, how what we have in our head, the idea of what we're going to make and what comes out if we're just learning it. And, you know, I mean, I've been doing this 25 years and I'm still learning. I'm certainly learning when I'm doing, you know, somebody else's work and what comes out is always going to disappoint us because that vision in our head is ahead of what we can actually do. And in pottery, I'm, for me, it's what keeps me challenged. And I have an opportunity now to work on some things that, um, you know, I don't know yet how they're going to turn out, but I'm so excited about it. And if it were easy and it would came out of the kiln looking great every time, I don't know that I would feel this excited still. And I'm still excited. So that's cool. I agree. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Patty, for sharing so much knowledge My with us. My pleasure. I'm amazed that 32 people are still here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. It was very, thank you. I, I didn't, uh, I, when I first told Yvonne I would do this, you know, you just do it because potters, that's what we're like. We all share stuff all the time. Um, unlike other mediums, I must say, we're really... Yeah. Potters are awesome. So I thought, yeah, you know, people have done that for me. Yes, I'll do it. And how much I got out of putting kind of my story together and why I do what I do and kind of taking a look at it again, has really been helpful. So thank you, Yvonne. Good. Thank you. I'm Fon. so glad. I'm so glad. Yeah, thank you to all my studio friends who came. You guys are awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Patty. Thank, thank you. you so much.